privilege. You know, I've only missed three Easter's in 35 years of the pastorate in Mountain View, Sunnyvale, California. I've only missed I've only missed three Easter's, and this is one of the three. But when Brother Hudson, when they, when they were with us in January, early February, he said, uh, "Would you would you think about coming and being with us on Easter?" And I, I didn't even have to think. He just said, I'm coming. So we have been in Mountain View, Sunnyville, Menlo Park for 35 years. Never missed any, three, three Easter's. But I'm so thrilled that I can stand behind this pulpit today. If you have your Bibles, in fact, would you stand with me, please, and would you turn to the Gospel according to John? And I'll just read a few scriptures here. John chapter 20, reading verses 1 through, 1 through 4. On Sunday morning, while it was still dark, and I apologize, I'm reading from the CEV UK the contemporary English version, UK, uh, British version. On Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran to Simon Peter and to Jesus' favorite disciple and said, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and, and, and we don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple set off for the tomb and they ran side by side until the other disciple ran faster than Peter and got there first. I want to talk to you for a few moments this morning on Jesus unknown on Easter. Jesus unknown on Easter. Pray that God will anoint me if you could please. God. I feel a great responsibility to deliver your word. I feel a great responsibility this morning, Lord, to preach your word with fervency, with anointing and effect. I pray you'll anoint me right now, Master. I pray that your word will reach out to a heart, change a life, touch a soul, do a work. In your name we pray, Jesus, through your word. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So for me... Easter is the most exciting Sunday of the whole year. I love to minister on Easter. And on Easter, there, it, the, the theme is, is, is right. The theme is good. Everything about the Easter message is good. And, 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 and the resurrection is just such a thrill to be able to minister about the resurrection. But do you understand? If Jesus had not risen from the grave, right. then what we're feeling today would have never happened. You're right. What an amazing move of the Spirit of God on Easter Sunday. Oh, yes. What an amazing right. touch of God. Right. Everything that's happened here today has been anointed by God's Spirit. But if, but if He had not risen, we would have no power in this place. We feel nothing here. It would be dead, it would be dry. And so if, if, if he had not risen, then the Old Testament would just be a myth. And it would just be something that we couldn't depend upon. If he had not risen, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in the upper room could have never happened. If he hadn't risen from the dead, then Jesus would have been an imposter. Prayer would be just a mockery. And the great doctrines of the church that all of us love so much would just be a figment of someone's imagination. Evangelism, evangelism would be a useless experience. Missionaries, they would have no reason to go across the seas to preach or to minister. The second coming of the Lord would just be a false hope. There would be no heaven. And, 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 and the Christians, we as Christians, we as Holy Ghost filled believers, we would have nothing to hold on to. 
if, if he had not risen from the dead. So why was Jesus not known on Easter? On this resurrection morning, why was he not known? The reason being Mary was looking for a dead Christ. She wasn't looking for a living Savior. She was looking for a dead God. Now, Jesus was the one that she loved and adored. Jesus was the one that she loved so much that he walked into her life and changed her life completely. And yet, she's looking for him as a dead Christ. She's coming to anoint him. Notice she didn't come to this tomb to witness the resurrection. She didn't come looking for the resurrected one. She came expecting to anoint a dead body. No clue that he is alive. And when this dead body was gone, she didn't think of terms of the resurrection, but in terms that someone had taken him away. Someone's coming, taking his body. She wasn't thinking resurrection thoughts. But she was looking for a God that was dead. No expectation of life. You know, we as fathers, we have this, this huge ego. Can I be transparent? We have this huge ego like, man, we've got to be the very best in everything. There, there, there was a son that, that had a father who this father claimed to be the best and the greatest and the most accurate duck hunter in the whole state of Texas. We're in Texas, so I'll make it a Texas story. <laughs> and so he bragged to his son, man, there's not, a, there's not a duck out there that can get out of my sights. I'm deadly. I, I can do it. And so he took his son duck hunting. His son's sitting there beside him in the boat, and a duck comes real low and real slow. And the dad says, that's a dead duck, son. He hauls off, unloads three shells, smoke everywhere for a few seconds. You can't see anything. And the duck is still flying low and slow. And the dad says, son, that's a miracle. That's the first dead duck I've ever seen still flying. We have such great expectations. Mary had no expectations that the Lord was alive. She thought he was dead. Nothing, nothing. And then the scripture tells us that he was unknown to his disciples. He wasn't known to his disciples. For three years, they had walked with him. For three years, he poured into them. And the Passion Week, one third of the Gospels are mentioned in the last week. See, one third of everything that Jesus ever taught his disciples, he crammed it into the last week, the Passion Week of his life. And he taught them, and he walked with them, and he communed with them, 
but yet the disciples did not understand the words that the Lord was trying to tell them and the lessons he was trying to teach them. He was unknown to his disciples. It's interesting in verse number four that these disciples are running together. Do you know that this is the only occasion in scripture where someone is running in, in the New Testament? It's the only place that's mentioned where they're running. They are running to a tomb, but they're anticipating that someone has stole his body. They're not running because they're excited. You know, wouldn't it be good? Wouldn't it be good if just once in our life we could get excited about God? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice just once to get excited about God and take a lap in the church? All right. Come on. There's a novel concept. I mean, coming to the house of God and really getting into it, huh? Just, just once. And the only time the disciples ever ran, they weren't running in anticipation to see him. They're running in anticipation to try to find out who stole his body. They didn't understand his word. They didn't understand what he was trying to tell them through his whole ministry. They didn't understand the scripture where he is going to be raised again. And they missed the whole message. They missed the fact that he said to them, if you kill, if you put this body down, if you kill this body in three days, it's going to be built again. It's going to be resurrected again. They didn't listen to the message that he preached. They didn't know that Jesus Christ, they didn't understand him because they were not persistent. They didn't persistently seek him, try to find him. Him. They came to the tomb in verse number 10. They came to the tomb. They looked around and they went back home. They didn't persistently try to find him. There's something in my heart that wants to know God. There's something in me that's so persistent. I, I want to know him. I want to touch him. I want to feel him. There's something in my heart. If, if I come to a service and he's not quite there, you know what I do? I, I, I try to find him. I, I, I try to reach out and touch him. I try to get close to him. I try to, oh God, where I, I, I need your touch. I, I need to feel your presence. There comes a time in your life, in your relationship with God, that you've got to serve Him and persistently try to touch Him regardless of how you feel. Has anybody here ever went through a trial? Have you ever went through a temptation? Have you ever went through a time that things were really tough and rough and yet you said, God, where are you? I still have to feel you. I still have to know that you care about me. I've still got to know that you're there. I've got to know God. I've got to. Just because you live for God doesn't exclude you from problems. I was a very naive preacher, pastor, when I took a church in Menlo Park, California, right next to Stanford University. I was a very naive young man when I took that church. I didn't realize that I only had eight people and I couldn't even get a hundred percent vote. Right. I had two people that were mentally challenged in the eight. They voted yes. All right. I couldn't even get a full vote. I remember calling Jim Shoemaker and saying in the press at the time, said, Jim, I, I can't take this church. I didn't even get a full vote. Man, he said, come on, Grandquist, get a life. He said, do it. God's in it. But I was so naive. I thought by the time I was going to be there a year, I'd be running a hundred. 
By the time I was going to be there two years, I'd be running 200. By the time I was there three years, I was going to be running 400. Man, at the end of three years, I think I was running, I think it was 32. And I thought, God, where are you? Where are you at, God? What's going on? And then I thought God was mad at me for a long time because he put me in the most expensive area in the whole United States. The San Francisco Bay Area. Do you know what a three-bedroom apartment is going for now? In, in, in a complex you want to stay in. <laughs> Would you believe $5,000 for a three bedroom apartment? Two bedroom, 3,500. That's a deal. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We got kids that in our church that work for Facebook and Google and Box. Sure, they're there, they're sitting on the front, second, third row, they're, they're there serving God. But they're paying $3,500 a month for a two-bedroom apartment. you got to make a lot of money from Google. Come on. Yeah. Google that. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brother Hudson. I always need your support. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I got a guy that's doing, he's in the church, he's, he's doing anti-terrorism for Facebook. Every day, the guy that started Facebook, he spends about an hour with him, one-on-one -on -one conversation, talking to him about anti-terrorism. That's how afraid Facebook is about terrorism and all the stuff that goes along with that. And the guy, and the guy sits on the, on the fourth row and worships God, serves God, comes to all the men's prayer meetings but he's paying $3,500 a month for a two-bedroom apartment. Good. And God put me there. Yeah. <laughs> he put me in the middle of all that, and for so long I thought God was mad at me. Have you ever, have you ever thought God was mad at you? Yeah. Have you ever thought God was ticked off with you? Come on now. Even though the Word of God said He's with you always, He loves you, He, you know, He's He's right there. He's a friend. Those sick, close to a mother, a father, sister, a brother. Have you, have you ever felt that that God was kind of mad at you? Yeah. For the first three years of my pastoral ministry, I thought God was mad at me, but I persistently said, God, you called me. I consistently says, God, I'm going to seek you. I consistently sought the presence of God and his, his face until the windows of heaven started to open, until the windows of heaven started to open up for me and great revival came to the San Francisco Bay Area. And, and forgive me, if you're not familiar with church talk, revival means increase. You're like, hey, I need a revival. And people say, oh, what? These postmoderns I teach to a revival? What's that, Pastor. No, that's just harvest. That's just in-gathering. That's just, you know, God's going to... And, and, and God has done that. But you have to persistently... See, God wants you to serve Him. God wants you to live for Him. God wants you to walk with Him. And for whatever reason, whatever reason, whatever reason that you're not, God is looking for you today. He's after you today. You picked a good Sunday to come to the house of the Lord because God is searching and seeking for you. And He loves you. And He wants you. He needs you. There's something about the presence of God when God shows up. Oh, that is the truth. And one of the reasons Mary didn't know the Lord is because she had such disappointment. Her disappointment was so great. Right. What's interesting, the four Gospels handle the resurrection completely different. Matthew talks about it in this majestic, glorious resurrection. Mark talks about the very fact that there will be this, this, this resurrection. Luke, he talked about the spiritual aspect of the resurrection. That's where, that's where he was talking about the, the, the spiritual aspects of it. But John, 
I love John's gospel. I love them all, but I love John's gospel. He talks about the feelings of those that love Jesus the most, how the resurrection affected them. I like personal stuff. I like somebody ministering to me that's a heart preacher. I like someone to touch me. That's what I, I like the personal touch. You know, I, I do texting and I do emails and I do all the stuff on the cell phone and, and, and I, I do all that. But whatever happened to taking out a fountain pen and taking a card? Did, you don't know what a card is? Yeah. You, you take the card out and you say on there, hey, man, I really love you. You mean so much to my life. I appreciate you so much and, and, and sign your name. Think of that. Kind of hard to sign your name to an app or to a, you know, to a text message or something. I like personal touch. What I love about John's gospel, he's personal. He's going to touch him. He's going to touch him. So Mary is so discouraged. She's standing on the outside of the tomb and she's crying. She's weeping. In verse number 12, an angel comes to her. And why are you weeping? In verses uh, 13, 14, and 15, the love that she had for Jesus was so great. She came to the tomb and she was willing. She was willing to roll the stone away herself. She was willing to try to do that, something she couldn't control. But she was lost in her thinking because she thought that Jesus was dead. Yes. Thomas withdrew from his brothers because of discouragement. The worst thing you can do is to withdraw from this family, this body of believers, because you're discouraged. That's the worst thing you can do. But who gets discouraged in Texas? God, I drive around these freeways. You're building massive buildings everywhere. Churches on air. How could you get discouraged? See, God loves Texas more than California. I get it. I got it. Okay, I get it. But God didn't let me pastor in the state of Texas. But but now, this is totally off the lesson. Forgive me if I'm wrong here. But but I don't think Texans are going to enjoy heaven. You know why you're not going to enjoy heaven? Because you've got heaven down here. Thomas was not there when the Lord appeared to the disciples. You know what's going to make Jesus known? What's going to make him known after the resurrection? You know what's going to make him known? The fact that he personally comes down and he personally enters into the room and he says, here I am. Come on, touch me. Here I am. I'm going to breathe on you. I'm going to fill you with the spirit. I'm going to fill you with my presence. That's the beauty of it all. That is the beauty of the resurrection is that Jesus is going to personally come back. He's going to come back to Thomas and he's going to say, here, I know you you weren't around when I appeared, but here, touch me. You can touch me. You can feel me. God has come into this service today, and he is saying to you, all you have to do is touch me. He's looking for you. He's coming for you. Oh, that's the God I serve. Would you stand with me? That personal presence. That personal touch. It's when Jesus walked back into their life. Touch me. That's what changed everything. You can't.
can't change until God touches you. You can't change until you have a closeness, a close touch with it. You can't. But he's here today. He's here to touch you. He can reach through your discouragement. He can reach through your pain. He can reach through all the things that are hindering and hurting you. He can reach beyond that. And he can touch you. And oh, how you need to change. How you need God's touch. So many needs. So many problems. That he can walk into your life. This morning. I'm here. Come in. I'm here. Change my life. I feel very strongly impressed that all of us need to come as many as can and stand around this altar for just a few moments. Just come and stand. Just reach out to him. Just touch him. Lift your voices. Lift your hands. Change me, God. Change me, God. Change me, Pastor. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. God, change me. God, touch me. I need your touch, God. Touch me, Master. Touch me, Master. Touch me. Change me, God. Change me, God.